So hello everyone who's listening in today and welcome to this um, Built for This conversation um, initiated by myself. I'm Shelia Stevens and this is my colleague Wynne Morgan and this is our beautiful guest at Brianne Griebel. Thank you for being here today. Um, this whole series is about having conversations in a in a time where there's a pandemic going on in the world and where we're all having a whole different um, set of circumstances and situations and how we can see that we can get through this because we're built for this. And Bran, we wanted to talk with you today about, you know, caring for a parent in, in these times. And so we would just love to hear your story and what you, what you've seen about this so far. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. This is very cool. I love that you guys are doing this. Um, well, for me, the interesting thing is for the first few weeks of this um, pandemic, I actually thought I was, um, I was skating through just fine. Um, I, w I definitely had so much compassion for just all of the craziness that's going on out there, but my personal world was pretty fine. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm in a, a very rural area where currently there have been no cases. Um, my, you know, I'm healthy, my husband's healthy. Um, our income looks, it's affected, but we'll be fine. Um, you know, all of the things that a lot of people I think are probably really stressed and worried about, um, we seem to be okay. So um, for me, for the first several weeks, it was, <laughs> it was actually like a, a vacation of sorts. And I know like for some people who are really in it, that might, you know, feel insulting, but it's just where my personal world was at. Compassion for so many other people struggle, but mine was light. Mm -hmm. um, but about um, two weeks in, so uh, the backstory, my mother um, has Alzheimer's and dementia. She's, um, uh, she's in the last stages. Um, you know, we're not sure how much longer she has, but she's near the end. Um, and she has been uh, in a memory care facility. And my father and I were spending, on average, between the two of us, about six hours a day with her. Um, every single day, without fail. We were with her every day. And um, we would help with her feedings and um, it was just so good to see her. And then of course with the, the COVID stuff, um, all facilities have, have locked everybody out except essential staff. So we kind of went from seeing her every single day to not being allowed to see her at all. So in the beginning of the COVID crisis, that very much did affect me. For the first week or so, I was having some very intense withdrawals, <laughs> um, separation anxiety. Um, you know, my mind was just going crazy. Like for me, even if she was having a bad day, something about at least I could see her. I could, I knew she was having a bad day. And, but all of a sudden now I didn't know what kind of day she was having. I didn't know how she was, you know, they, they would update us about how she was doing. But, um, so for the first week that was very stressful for me, very like, wow, I was really attached to how she was doing and, um, being able to see her and, um, you know, then every, that was taken away. But the interesting thing is, is not too long after there was actually a piece that came in because I was given full permission to let go of my mom and how she's doing. And, um, you know, I didn't realize how much I still had my well-being was tied to her well-being. Yeah. Um, so as long as I could check in on her and I knew, then I could find some peace and relaxation. But there was something about um, I'm not to blame for not seeing my mom. It's not my fault. I can't see her. I'm not a bad daughter. Um, there's no guilt. There's no. Um, so for me, there actually became a very deep rest. I didn't realize, even though I was really fine um, seeing her and being with her, it still was taking a lot of energy um, yeah. to be with her when she's in that condition, you know, to be with somebody when they are struggling so hard. Um, and being with them and seeing that day after day after day and showing up for them and being present for them and just one, even though I wanted to be there, it was a lot <laughs> every single day, month on end. So about week two, I found myself very like well rested, the most rest I felt in a year. Um, and not just getting sleep, just a deep rest of like, yeah. I don't have to think about anything. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was like this interesting roller coaster. And then of course, 
we went on another ride in um, about two and a half weeks in the facility called us and they said your mother has to move we can't take care of her here she's kind of reaching a level of care that we can't provide um, and we were furious <laughs> um, we uh, we appealed their decision. We were like begging them, can you please wait until the COVID stuff is over for so many reasons. Her health, um, the health of the people in the new facility, um, her emotional well being. She's going to be moving to a new place with new people. We can't be there with her for the transition. So, not even us will have that. She'll have that familiarity. Um, she, she'll have no concept of what's going on. Um, we can't tour any of the facilities to go see if they meet our standard. Like, just please don't. And we fought them for like two weeks. Um, and eventually this, they just basically, I mean, we appealed to the state and I even wrote to the governor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was like doing everything I can because I thought that was what that was best for my mom. Yeah. Um, and me too, by the way. Um, I also didn't want to have to go through all of the work of what we would have to do to move her during all of this. Um, but uh, early last week, it was finally very clear. There's nothing, we don't have any say in this whatsoever. Um, and then another piece came over me. Like that was so stressful. I was so anxious. I was so worried, but then the decision was made and I had done all I could. And so now I was like, okay, well then let me make some phone calls. Let me call other facilities. Let me see if they're taking people. Let me see, you know, the cost is going to double for us moving her into a different kind of facility. So what are our financing options? Can we apply, apply for our, you know, government aid over here? What does that involve, you know? And it was just things to do. Um, and so what I've noticed in the, in the realm of built for this, you know, whatever the this is. Yeah, whatever <laughs> you know, this is. <laughs> whatever your this is. The yeah. pandemic, uh, uh, an elderly parent, your own health, your own finances. Um, whatever you think the, the, the this is, I just see over and over and over and over again that we just have a capacity to meet the moment. Mm -hmm. it, you know, beyond our own ideas of what we like and we don't like. I mean, I have a preference for sure. I don't want to move mom. I liked the place she was in. I thought they were taking as good of care of her as possible. I liked the environment. I liked the staff. I liked everything about it. I don't want her to move. And yet it's kind of like there are decisions that life is going to make for us. Like whether we like it or not, it doesn't matter. And if, if you can, like once your own opinions subside, either because you calmed down or just life took all the options off the plate, then you're just good again. Then there's just stuff to do or not do there, you know? And I think what we can so innocently do and, and me too, obviously, cause I was so worked up in the beginning when I couldn't see her. And I was so worked up again when we just learned we had to, to move her. Like, when that happens, it's just we, we forget that or we don't realize that we have the capacity to meet the moment. We have the capacity to work with whatever we have available to work with us. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just that seeing over and over and over again mm -hmm. that allows me to ride those waves. <laughs> it doesn't stop the waves. <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, in the beginning, I thought that's, you know, when I was listening to similar conversations, um, hearing other people talk about like life and things, I was listening, to trying to stop the waves. Like, okay, yeah. if I just understand what people, these people are talking about, and if I have the right tools and the right strategies and the right methods and the right understanding and the right attitude, like I can, okay, maybe I can't stop the waves, but I can make them softer. <laughs> uh, and I just, over and over again, life just, you know, will hurl a tsunami at me and remind me I, I don't get to do that. Um, but then also remind me, you know, I, the energy of the tsunami can't, it can't hurt me. It can't permanently damage me. It can, I can feel beat up, but I'll, you know, in a metaphor, I'll heal. I'll, I'll be okay. I'll get, you know, give it a minute. I'll be off and running again. Yeah, that's kind of, in a nutshell, the last, <laughs> what, what, what week are we in over here? Five, six? I don't even know. Oh my gosh, I don't even know what week we're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what it's making me think of too, 
And my dad is also in care and he has been since I since I've been seven years old from mm. a mo- from a motorcycle accident. And when my mom passed away, um, he was taken care of for eight years in his house from around the clock caregivers. And at some point my sister approached me and um, said she would like to take him to to her house and and be his caregiver. And for anybody else, that might be an amazing piece of information. I I live live in Germany. They live in, at the time, in Tennessee. And um, I was dead set against it. Uh, it, it, it makes me it makes me think of what you were what you're saying about us having a preference. I had a very strong preference that he, he not go to her because my mom really worked her self to the bone taking care of him, and I was worried about her. I didn't want her to get into that situation that that my mom had been mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. And you know, she decided for it anyway, and it went forward, and and it turned out to be for a long, really long time, a really great thing. I mean, he just bloomed and she was enjoying it and brought brought her so much meaning. And it makes me think of that um, story that George always tells about like not knowing what a good outcome is, you know, like you, you finding yourself in this situation where you can't see your mom and then the outcome being you get a lot of rest and, and you can, you realize you see something for yourself. Mm-hmm. Namely, that you have been attaching your well-being to her well-being, or this new situation. Like we don't know what a good outcome is, and it changes. Um, you know, I don't know how long my dad will stay with my sister. It looks like he might be going to a new place. Who knows what that's going to bring? You know. So what do you what do you see about that, Brian? Like about um, one of my favorite authors is Kurt Vonnegut, and he has. Um, he, he wrote in a book, um, I think it's in his book, um, Man Without a Country. It's just a series of short essays. Um, but this line has stuck, I don't remember when I read it, I think it was like 15 years ago, and it sticks with me all the time, and it's so simple. He says, none of us has been here long enough to know what's the good news and what's the bad news. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really just, you know, even when I was so upset with the, with the management of her facility, and I was writing letters, and I was making phone calls, Part of me still is like also just genuinely admitting and like, I really honestly don't know what's best. <laughs> I don't know what's right. I don't know what will be best for her, best for us. I genuinely don't know. I, I was fully aware. I am going with my preference. Um, I am going with what I want, what I think is best with the limited scope of information that I actually have. And I'm going to go with it until I can't go with it anymore. <laughs> um, but there was just enough space around it, you know, to, for the recognition of, I don't actually know, you know, and even if the next thing turns out to what I think is to be worse, you know, if I feel like it, it's always a temporary state of mind that makes us decide what's good and bad. You know, we, d- we never have enough information to make that assessment when it comes to the grand scheme of life. You know, I, I often say, <laughs> I've actually come to learn that even if I really think I know a lot, like if I could somehow quantify, put a number to the things I know, if I knew a million things, um, in the scope of what there is to know, which I'm pretty sure is infinite, I know 0%. Yeah. Like <laughs> I know 0% about what's actually going on, what's good or bad, what's in my best interest and not, what, you know, what will move me forward into a better place, what, you know, I don't know any of that really. So again, it doesn't gonna, it's not going to stop me from trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try like, this is what I think is best. But it's really good to have the, the buffer of, of knowing like, you can give it your all, you can move in a direction. I fought really hard to keep my mom there. And it didn't work out. And so I, I could pivot. Because and I could pivot because I'm like, well, I went with something all in didn't work. There's to me no point in, in, in ruminating over it. I mean, that's not entirely true. I've still like, I've still got a little resentment (laughs) (laughs) towards the people at the management team, but, but it's not limiting me. It's not holding me back. It's not, I'm not stewing in that. It's just, yeah. Okay. What's next? What is next? Um, And I think that's, 
even if you don't like what is now, you are always capable of meeting what's next. W whatever it is. Yeah. Like you can hate now. It's fine. Like I, I like f hate now. It's totally cool. Like, but you're built for whatever, whatever's next. Like you're built for the hate of now so that you can deal with what comes next. You know? <laughs> You know, I was about to ask you if there are people watching and listening to you speaking right now and, and they're struggling with their roller coaster, what you'd say. Now, in my mind, you've kind of answered a little bit of that now by regarding you can hate what now, but you know that you built for what's next. Anything else that comes to mind if someone is struggling with their own roller coaster right now? Well, the thing that occurs to me is if like you're really on the roller coaster, it kind of doesn't matter what I say. <laughs> um, <laughs> like somebody who's really feeling something intensely, I don't think there's anything to be done but feel it. Um, I mean, if they're listening for some sort of um, strategy or soothing words or um, I, don't, I don't know if I have those because um, I can totally imagine somebody really being in the, the muck of something in their life. And I could say something and genuinely mean it as comfort, but they could hear it as an insult. Um, you know, you don't know my story. You don't know my life. You don't know why I'm here. You don't understand. How, how could you say that to me? How dare you? It doesn't work that way for me. It's not, you know, I get that. Um, the only thing I can think to say is if in the moments that you can, when there is a little space, when you are feeling you know, not quite in the thick of it, you know, we have a capacity to be able to see a bigger picture, to be able to see more than this exact moment or this exact feeling or this exact situation. And if you can zoom out, you're able to see you've always made it through. Like you've, there's always been something next, always. Like there's only ever forward movement. You know, you know, I look at nature, I, to me, nature is where it's very easy to see that you, you, as a human being, I may look at something in nature and go like, oh, that's chaos, but it's also necessary for the next step of evolution. You know, fire, you know, it, it comes and it decimates, but it also lays ground for the next fertile stuff to come through. And that's it, like, it, we, it doesn't work different for us. We're not separate from everything else in existence. It, it's there's there's chaos and and construction you know there's tearing down and building up there there is ugliness and beautiness beautiness well that's a word now <laughs> <laughs> um and that's where i find my peace yeah i don't find my peace in in specific moments i don't find my peace in the content of life i find my peace in the bigger picture of it all you know that's how i've made peace with the roller coaster even when i hate the roller coaster <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. It's just Thank beautiful. you guys. I'm so glad you shared this. I'm sure someone's gonna hear something for themselves. Yeah, and I'm really glad you guys are facilitating these and putting them out there. Yeah, me too. We've enjoyed the conversations tremendously. And if you want to hear more of these conversations, underneath this video we'll be posting a link to where you can go to find other conversations um, built for this. We hope you'll join us there. And thanks so much, Brianne. Thanks, Wynn. And see you guys soon. Such a joy. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Bye.